Well, thank you everyone for joining our webinar today. We're about to start. I'm Leon Lloyd. I'm the Business Development Manager with Edumundo, and I'm joined by my colleague uh, Milo Hendricks as well. This webinar is all around developing authentic learning within the business schools using business simulations or management simulations. We're really grateful to be joined by some great guest speakers today uh, from Westminster Business School. So we have Katerina Cardoso, a senior lecturer and module leader at the University of Westminster. And we also have Dr. Vincent Rich, principal lecture, lecturer also at the business school uh, at, at University of Westminster. So thanks for all, all for joining. Um, we're going to get right into it now. Uh, I think we'll probably have a few more people joining as we uh, start off, but that's absolutely fine. Well, just to talk a little bit about the format of today's uh, session. So, well, I'm hosting the session uh, and with my colleague Milo as well. Uh, we are recording this session, so we're already recording it. Uh, so please be aware. We like to record these sessions so that we can, of course, share uh, the recordings with all the attendees afterwards, but also with anyone who signed up uh, and meant to be here that couldn't make it. Do expect a bit of interactivity today. We'll try and make it as interactive as possible. We have a few poll questions, for example, and we'll also be um, taking questions. So feel free to use the chat function uh, to ask any questions. And we'll also try to make sure we've got a good bit of time uh, at the end for some, some, some questions, in which case we'll try to unmute you uh, and show your video if you like, so you can ask the question yourself. Um, if you do have more questions afterwards, uh, please feel free to reply to any of the webinar communications you've received from my colleague Callum uh, or anyone else at Enduando. We'll be happy to help with any questions you have. Uh, it might be worth just mentioning quickly uh, that if you'd like to drop in the chat uh, where you're calling from today, where, where you're joining from, uh, we're always really keen to see. I know we've got probably a lot of people from various countries ac across the world joining, uh, perhaps a few from the Middle East, um, maybe a few from North America as well. So feel free to, to say in the chat where you're, you're calling from. Well, the format of the day, uh, so well, we're already at five past, just gone. Uh, we are always, we always like to sort of spend just a, a five or 10 minutes at the start, just to giving a quick bit of background and context to who we are as a company, what we do and our approach uh, to simulations as well. And then the bulk of the session, of course, will be on discussing uh, with our guest speakers, Vincent and Katerina about uh, well, all around using simulations uh, to promote authentic learning within Westminster Business School. But some of the topics we'll be focusing on will be, for example, applying concepts of decision making, building employability skills. We'll be looking a little bit about course assessment as well and thinking around, uh, you know, the impact of blended learning as well. And perhaps how things have changed, certainly over the last uh, year and a half as well. If we've got time towards the end, we'll try to have sort of uh, five minutes or so just to give a little sneak peek, a uh, little, little overview of the trainer's sneaker simulation as well. Um, and we'll make sure we've got a bit of time. Uh, we sometimes overrun, so we are hoping to finish uh, on, the, on the top of the hour, but well, we, we, we often, uh, there's often so much to talk about, so we may well run, out, run over a little bit and feel free to stay on, of course, to ask further questions. We'll try and keep the, uh, the, the, the call open. Okay. Well, I can see in the chat we've got a yeah a few people from from different areas as well. So someone from New York, which is great to see. Uh, someone from the UK and Brighton, from Ireland. Uh, we've also got uh, Gibraltar. Canada. Hi, Jan. Uh, Canada as well. Uh, Saudi, Arabia. Saudi Arabia and France. So yeah, lots of different uh, countries represented today. So that's really really nice to welcome you all. Thank you so much for joining. Okay. Well, a little bit about uh, Edumundo. So who we are, well, we've actually been going since 2001 with a core focus of developing these management simulations. Uh, so it's actually our 20th year this year. So happy birthday to Edumundo. Well, we have around 40 employees uh, who are mostly based uh, at our head office in the Netherlands, in The Hague, although we have uh, some employees, uh, for example, in the UK. Uh, we have around three or four in the UK. And also we have representatives in other parts of the world as well, for example, in the Middle East. Our core focus is actually on the higher education sector. So we work with around 300 universities worldwide uh, in various countries, of course, in every continent of the world. But we also work with the private sector, too. So we support a number of corporates, uh, for example, with their 
leadership development programs and talent acquisition programs in some cases. And that knowledge uh, and experience we're able to feed back into the product development lifecycle as well. As you can imagine, it's quite a large number of students that we support each year. So, oh, I've gone too far there. I'm gonna go back a slide. So whilst we have a wide portfolio of management simulations, there are some commonalities. So this is quite a useful slide just to be aware of in terms of how it works. They're all web-based. They all work on the browser as you'd expect. And well, there's no software to install and they work on any device. Students will in teams of usually three, four or five manage a company. So they take over an existing company usually and they will then uh, undertake a range of external internal analysis before deciding on the strategic direction that their business should go in and then taking a lot of tactical actions or decisions to propel their company forward. Usually we have one round representing one year of operations. There are some exceptions, but that's typically how our simulations work. So one round is one year of operations. Often that will be scheduled throughout a semester. So one round is played per week of study, although there are some exceptions to that. And we often do some very intensive simulations, uh, for example, in induction events or MBA residentials. The time investment is very flexible, depending on the level, of course, of the students and how much time you've got available, uh, but they're very competitive. And what we mean by that is that our simulations, all of them are truly dynamic in the sense that there's no one clear path to win because every time the simulation runs, it's the, the outcome is unknown. And well, it all depends on all the decision points from all of the different teams. So each team is genuinely competing against every other student team on the same course, which is really nice. And that really leads to the engagement, to the, uh, yeah, to, to, to the fun, and of course, to the understanding and the theory and everything else. We cater for a range of student levels. So actually from sort of foundation level uh, in the UK, that's level three, uh, right up to level seven, uh, MBA and MSc as well. And a number of our simulations are very flexible. So we can often tailor them to make them less or more complex, depending on the level, or to align more towards a certain subject area as well. Okay, just a couple more slides. Well, why management simulations? This is a bit more high level, but typically the reasons why we'd like, why we think it's good to use a management simulation is to promote the student engagement. Of course, it's an opportunity for students to apply their theoretical knowledge in a safe way. So it really promotes that sort of high value, uh, well, safe exposure to high value decision making. Um, it's a good chance to improve the learning experience. And we typically see uh, real improvement in module satisfaction in the module evaluations. And of course, there's a real strong link to employability skills as well, which we'll talk a bit more about today uh, in detail. But on a high level, you know, often this, is, this has a strong link to things like improving progression and retention, uh, which is all obviously highly desirable for, uh, for, for most higher education institutions. So just a quick word about uh, the various simulations we have. So we do have a large portfolio of simulations. These are some of them. And as you'll see, we have, for example, some which are more focusing on international business, uh, the emerging markets one, which is focusing more on the BRIC countries, but also uh, phone ventures, which is focusing on uh, all markets with all geographic markets uh, globally. And, you know, teams can choose where they want to do business in and have to, to undertake a range of analysis accordingly. We have other simulations as well, perhaps some more focused on sort of classic strategic management, some focused more on strategic marketing, some more on the sort of classic marketing, like the seven Ps with my marketing experience. And then we have some which are focusing more on in other areas as well. So uh, the tour, tour operator, which is managing an online Expedia like travel agency uh, and the chocolate firm, which could be a little bit about strategic management accounting, often used at final year undergraduate, uh, whether the teams are managing their own manufacturer of a chocolate uh, company. Uh, we have some more lower level simulations as well for foundation levels, as well as uh, other uh, financial management and accounting type simulations too. Um, as you can see, these are just an example of the different simulations we have, but we, we do have a very good range. And we like to think that actually, if you want to strategically deploy uh, a range of simulations across the business school at various levels and all subjects, then we're able to, to, to support that. Okay, well, 
I think that's, uh, that's all the slides I'm going to show for now. I'm going to stop sharing. And straight away, I'm going to ask uh, our colleague, our guest speakers, Katerina and Vincent, to, uh, well, hello both. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Vincent, perhaps you first. Uh, hello, everyone. Really good to be here with you. Uh, yeah, I'm Dr. Vincent Rich. I'm a principal lecturer in international development and economics. And I was involved in the development of this module. So great to see you uh, and looking forward to your questions. Hello. Thanks, Vincent. And Katerina, sorry. Hi. No, um, no. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Katerina Raya Cardozo, and I'm the module leader for uh, this module, uh, Management Decision Making. Uh, I've, so I've been teaching on it for about five years, but um, now basically uh, being the module leader. And um, yeah, I'm really happy to be able to talk about how I've been using the game, both in terms of the teaching and also the assessment. That's great. Thank you both. And well, look, really looking forward to getting into the conversation. Um, authentic learning obviously is, uh, has been around for a number of years and there's various papers written about it. There's, there's lots to say about the subject, but we're obviously keen to see what your take is on, on this and sort of how you build in simulations to, to promote authentic learning within Westminster Business School. So, um, well, perhaps it's a good starting point. Uh, Vincent, if I just bring up this slide here and then ask you to talk a little bit uh, around that. So if I just share my screen, would you like to just talk through this slide a little bit and, and give us some context? Yeah, happy to, happy to, Leon, yes. Um, so I just wanted to set the context and so it, it becomes easier for you to understand the nature of, of the module we've been running and how the uh, Edamundo simulation really has, has helped us to build um, sort of a practical element to what we're doing. So the, the, the module that um, Katerina runs now and, and that I helped develop is a second year core module on, on our big business management program. Uh, and that business management program has, I've, I've said here 700 plus students um, and, and it is, and it's big, it runs in two semesters. So in, we have a two semester system. So it runs in, in half of it in one semester and then another half, and then the other students take it in the second semester. And it's taught across eight specialist pathways on the business management program. Um, and that that's, adds a level of complexity insofar as, um, and I'm sure you're aware if, as academics, um, because we have students who may be on pathways where, which are much more technical and numerical like finance or economics. And at the other extreme, we might have students on pathways like HRM where soft skills are more important. And, it, and it's, a, it's a matter of trying to engage that whole range of students with different um, attributes and, and, and ideas of, of the specialism. In terms of what the students know when they get to this module, they will all have taken um, a common first year. Um, so five of their six modules in the first year are core and they will have taken a whole range of business subjects. So, so they're prepared, they've got the groundwork in all the main disciplinary areas. But one thing that we've, try to do with this module is to try and use it as an integrating module at level at level five in the second year and to pull together some of that learning which the students would have had and that that's proved to be quite difficult um, at times. Um, it is very much a practically focused module uh, and that's why um, even though we have sort of a theoretical core to it that's why something like uh, a simulation it has proved incredibly valuable in terms of bringing to life a lot of the concepts and techniques. It's a, an operational decision-making module, so it's not strategy. So we were looking for a simulation which was able to uh, engage the students in, in operational decision-making. And just to finish off, um, we first used uh, an Edmundo business simulation, um, the precursor of this one that we're using at the moment, we used about six years ago um, because we were trying to solve a problem, which was to try and pull together all the concepts into a sort of a practical decision-making um, scenario. Now we did that, but in a very formalized way, which was uh, a very time consuming way. And it wasn't really dynamic. And what this enables us to do 
the simulation, we use the trainer startup one now, is to cover a whole range of um, functional operational decision making and to really mimic real life. And, and the students have found it really quite, quite an um, interesting and, and um, uh, intriguing way of learning. So um, by way of background, that sort of gives you an idea of what, how we're using it. So we're using the trainer's startup game. I just wanted to next say something uh, about um, the subject matter of today's um, webinar in a way, and, that, and that's to do with authentic learning. I just want to say a little bit about that. Can I pull the next slide up, Vincent? Please, yes, if you yeah. could. Um, and I'm sure all of you have grappled with the idea of authenticity and, and what we mean by authentic uh, authenticity in terms of higher education. And for me, um, authenticity is about the idea of um, how knowledge will be used in, in real life context. So we're trying to, in a sense, build in the idea of real life experience within the, the, the within modules that we, we use. And alongside that, clearly, the a module like this, plus if we were able to capture those real life skills, would, would really build um, people's work readiness and their employability skills at the same time. Now, what this slide is meant to mean, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I'm in a pedagogic expert, but it's something that we would have thought through in the university um, in terms of how how we're going to deal with this idea of authentic learning um, assessment and design. And uh, if we think of authenticity throughout throughout those different parts of, of a module. So in the design phase, we would want to make sure that any learning outcomes or learning objectives we have are actually framed in a way which are authentic. Um, which actually blend somehow the practical and the theoretical um, in a way that is valuable to students. Um, and then within that, we might have the idea of authentic learning as well. Um, and authentic learning is going to be, um, you know, it's going to, it's going to bring in these real life skills in, in different ways. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more when I talk about the how the business simulation does that. And then the final thing is uh, what we might call authentic assessment, um, which is something that uh, Katarina will talk a little bit more about in the future. But clearly, the assessment is key to this. And the reason why I've, I, I don't see this as a, a linear um, process, I think in many ways, the assessment is the key to this. And really, if you're looking at designing a module and thinking about uh, uh, the way that learning takes place, you would really have to begin with the idea of the assessment and what you're hoping that students will achieve um, by studying the module, by, by, by participating in the module. Now, let me just say a little bit about the business simulation and how that works. Um, if you read the literature about simulations, it talks about these characteristics. It talks about business simulations being interactive, immersive, engaging, and collaborative in the way that they are um, engaged with by students. And all those things actually be, bring with them very important um, authentic traits in learning, I, I would think. One thing about the business simulation is that it, it's di dynamic. Um, it's dynamic, it's changing, and it, it is driven by um, the interactions of students. So students who play these games uh, have an effect on other students. And if they play them as teams or businesses, then, then they will uh, really experience what's going on in, in, in a real life situation. The problems are realistic. So what's built into the simulation are real, realistic business stroke managerial problems, which are about Solve, solving problems and, and how the process, how that process of problem solving occurs. And often the, you know, the areas are complex and ill-defined, which is again, something that you would hope to find in, in, in a learning uh, process, but also in terms of assessment. And the two other areas where I think really the business simulation works pretty well for us is this last bit about the collaborative side, because again, uh, students operate not independently, they operate in groups or teams. There are elements of discussion that we can have around the idea of team working, I think, and how we form those teams. But often these problems they look at could not be solved independently. They would have to be solved uh, in, in some cooperative way. And I think, again, this is, this is an area where the simulation builds in real life experiences in, in a very good way. 
And the final thing I think, which is about the authenticity in learning is, is that there, there is a built in element of reflection, what you might call social reflection here, that the reflection that takes place is a, is a constant reflection within uh, teams who are participating in this simulation activity and they discuss, they reflect, um, they interrogate data, they question things they've done in a cooperative way. And I, again, I think this is you know, an authentic way uh, that students can learn and the simulation really is a, is a great vehicle to help them do that. So I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, I hope I haven't gone on too long and I'm going to ask uh, Katerina to move on a little bit about how in, in a real sense, we've sort of incorporated the learning and, and um, assessment within this particular module. Thank you, Vincent. Yes, so, um, uh, so I started working with Vincent on this module quite some uh, years ago. Uh, and uh, this year uh, has been quite different because uh, the university decided to uh, stop having exams. And we have everything, uh, even for more quantitative modules, it's everything is with um, um, <clears throat> uh, authentic assessment. So uh, we used to have two assessments. We used to have uh, one small piece of coursework, which was mostly research, and then an exam, um, which covered the exam covered, I would say, 90% of the, of the material of the module. Uh, so now we've changed that. Uh, we still have two pieces of assessment, but uh, they are both related to the application of the techniques that students learn and the game has been very useful in this respect. So the first assessment is a presentation. Students need to present, uh, um, they have to ask some questions about decision making uh, based on what they've been doing in the game. So just as an example, one question is they need to say which competitive strategy did they choose and why. So they need to explain why they use it and how they've been using it in the game and why did they choose that one and not another one. Uh, and then they have another questions about, uh, which is also about applying the knowledge that they get from the lectures and seminars to their experience of playing the game in teams. Uh, and then the second uh, assessment is a report in which again, uh, we, so the idea is that they answer a number of questions all related to the game. Uh, we, Originally, we were going to have it, they had to answer the question in relation to their own companies, and it turns out that was too difficult. So now um, we have like a, a case study, which is like a company, but everybody has the same case study and the same information. And uh, it's brilliant because then we use the, the, the game to um, help them learn. So um, as Vincent said, it, the, the, the course is very much designed thinking how they're going to be assessed. Will they be able to apply those techniques? And, and the, game, the game helps them practice the techniques uh, and practicing skills in a sort of non-certain non environment because they don't know what's gonna happen. They can play very well and still do badly in a way if it depends on what others do, yeah? Uh, so it's very real life in that sense. And then it's used in the, in the, in the assessment. So yes, in a nutshell, I think that's the, what we've been doing this, this year. That's great. Sorry, I was on mute then. Uh, but uh, that's, that's fine. Thank you so much for, for, for the input there. And actually, I thought it might be a good opportunity now just to ask uh, my colleague, uh, Hez, to uh, deliver one of these poll questions that we've got. Which of these statements describes authentic learning? Tasks that simulate the contemporary working environment, enhancing career readiness and employability skills, real world practice based challenges to which students apply I think that's supposed to be their theory, their theoretical knowledge, uh, or the last one, all of the above. So we've got about nine or 10 people who have answered. It's just, it's of course, we're not testing you on this. It's just a bit of, bit of fun really, and a, a bit of interaction. So we've had 21 people who have participated. Well, I think the clear winner is all of the above and absolutely true. So there's uh, actually what your slides, Vincent, were really helpful in talking a lot about, you know, the, the, what, what is authenticity in the curriculum. Uh, and I think yeah, perhaps it's important to say as well. Yeah, we've got a really good, good response there, all of, all of the uh, above. So, yeah, I was just going to sort of mention that there's, there's, there has been a lot of yeah, research done over the years uh, in authentic learning. And I think even 
perhaps the, the, the term was first coined, perhaps even in the 80s, you know, there was uh, studies and papers which were then expanded upon in the 90s a bit more. And I think in the, uh, I think around 2007, there was a real great uh, sort of well-regarded paper by uh, Marilyn May Lombardi at Duke University, um, Authentic Learning for the 21st Century. I'll try and share a link to it in the chat, perhaps before we finish the session today, but it talks about these 10 elements which really help to, uh, well, they sort of, they can be used as a, like design elements, which can be used as a checklist to determine whether or not your, uh, your, your course is bringing in authenticity into it. And it's, it really reminded me a lot when you were talking, Vincent, because a lot of those things around the reflection, uh, around trying to link it to, to, to real world problems, uh, around the fact that all the data shouldn't be there necessarily or at least it shouldn't be obvious what the solution is uh it should be there should be room for interpretation that students have to find out things for themselves so yeah it was really i suppose it really it, it really struck home I, I suppose what you were saying and how relevant that was to authentic learning which is great of course I, I just wanted to ask perhaps vincent coming back to the first slide that you showed when you were talking about the background and the context for your your module and, and, and this uh MDM, this management decision-making decision module, you mentioned around the eight specialist pathways. So they do the common first year, right? And then they all get to choose a little bit which direction they're going in. But then they're still doing this, this overall mm -hmm. module together. So that means then that you've got lots of students who aren't really, yeah, they're not doing the same pathway and they're all coming together in this simulation. So I wondered if, if maybe it's just worth uh, talking in a bit more detail about that. And, and is, you, well, for example, do you think that's a benefit to the students themselves because then they're getting exposed to different ideas, different viewpoints, different specialisms? Yeah, I mean, I think it is. I mean, I think that it, this, the module was always thought of as an integrative module because, uh, you know, what we didn't want to do is to have um, disciplines compartmentalised so the core disciplines of business clearly have to be taught to get the concepts. But the idea in the second year was, was to be sort of an area of, of integration. And this module does that. But something, um, but there's also issues. There's issues in terms of students who find the um, numerical quantitative side a little more, bit more challenging. <clears throat> and they certainly haven't cho chosen a pathway which takes them down that route. Um, but, you know, we felt that this module is an essential part of any business program. And what it does is, <clears throat> sorry, it's a link from the first year to a final year strategy module, which again has typically used a, a simulation as well. But the, it's a stepping stone for students to integrate their knowledge in a way which is practical. But one of the things that we struggled with was to, to get them to see the relevance of it and how it could be used. And the idea with a simulation like this, which, as I say, we use the trainer startup, is that it doesn't complicate things by having a whole lot of production side things. It's a, it's a merchandising game. And actually, that enables us to, to get very quickly to the idea of um, using operational decisions for competitive advantage, but without having all the detailed technical sides of, of the costing of it all. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and you're quite right. So in this simulation, the, the student teams are having to make an arrangement or, you know, an agreement with a manufacturer to produce their trainers or sneakers under license for them. So, yes, they're not getting involved with uh, too many production issues aside from the sort of R&D type uh, decisions a little bit as well, yeah. isn't it? But it's really, that, yeah, it's really that sort of that, that interdisciplinary focus, yeah. I suppose, I was, I was keen to emphasize the fact that you've well, I suppose on two levels. So one is even within the simulation itself, you're exposing students to those multiple different functional areas, those different departmental areas, which in itself is getting them to think more in a sort of interdisciplinary way. But beyond that, then having all these students that are also then focusing uh, on the different specialisms, they're, they're bringing different viewpoints to the team as well. And having said that, can I just say one more thing, Leon? I don't want to sure. jump in on this, but having said that, we they do the simulation in, in, in groups because it is fairly complex. We need groups of five. And within that, they play roles. So they play the role. They could actually be the HR manager. They could be the marketing manager. So you might get the opportunity to step into a role like marketing that you really actually see as your area of interest. So 
the game and allows the mixing of, of different disciplines, I think, as well, which I think is valued by students. Okay, well, I was, you know, I was thinking that in terms of the, the building work life skills part of this, you know, we, we've actually held previous webinars specifically on simulations to support employability skills. And whilst this one is more focused on authentic learning, I think the two really are not separate subjects, really. They're, they're, they're sort of one and the same thing in, in a sense, because you can't really have authentic learning without it being, without it sort of leading towards the development of those skills. So I just wondered if we could talk a little bit about skill development, the importance of that and how that's sort of built into it. Um, Katerina, I don't know if you want to say something about that. Uh, yeah, so uh, no, they basically, they learn a number of skills. So first of all, is about uh, having to work together. Uh, I think that some teams find that very easy, others less easy. And then there is an element of reflection as well, uh, which again is linked to the assessment. So they need to, it's not just about working together, it's also about reflecting how did that go and whether that helped in relation to the business and in relation to the decisions. So we also teach them different uh, approaches to decision-making and different ways of working together and the pros and cons of decisions on your own. When is it good to take a, your own decision? It's quicker usually. Uh, when is better to take a decision uh, in a group? Because you get different point of views, especially if there is a diversity of students, which there is in this, uh, in this module. And they need to think about all of that. So, uh, so that's an, an important skill, which they can use for a number of different things. Um, and uh, the other one is basically about using their knowledge and apply it to something which is um, to some extent a real life situation. So whatever the results cannot be predicted, uh, you're not going to have some right and wrong answers. There can be a number of right answers. Um, you need to basically take into consideration factors over which you have controls, uh, others over you, you do not have control. So it's, it's really, I think in terms of employability and the ability to uh, apply what they learn, uh, it's very it's very useful and they also one other thing i think they are they learn to they they practice thinking because it's not just about applying something it's also about looking at the situation and having to decide what to do without no one telling you what is it you don't won't find the answer in the book your lecturer cannot give you the answer so they really have to think about it instead of just memorizing and doing a certain activity yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I think I think what what was really interesting for me there, Katerina, was was around um, so thinking about this idea of a a right and wrong, right? So there's there's I think when students first come into university, perhaps at the very start, there's this whole classic feeling that maybe you know students want to they want a clear right answer and they want to learn the right answer yeah. and then they want to be able to say I've remembered the right answer right but actually you know as they progress through university it should be about sort of coming to terms with the fact that maybe that those right answers are in inverted commas are, are actually open to interpretation and that's mm -hmm. what it's all about it's all about discussing that giving different viewpoints and I suppose the simulation really allows for that because it because of its na team-based nature it's bringing as you say it's bringing those different viewpoints together and allowing students that sort of context and relevance to do so in their teams but on the basis of yeah a, a real business so the theory yeah. isn't isolated on its own the theory is always positioned in context to the practice which is yeah. you know this real business isn't it and one thing which is quite useful is often students will struggle they will say oh i'm not doing well in the game uh, why is that uh, and and they expect that we're going to tell them oh this is what you need to do now and we say, well, we don't say that, of course. We say, okay, let's see, w what, are, what are the possible reasons that may explain this? So, and then we can go through all the material. Let's say we're on week four. We'll ask questions in relation to those four weeks we've taught and say, have you considered these, these or that? And they're kind of quite surprised. Uh, I mean, every time they are surprised to see that something we've covered in the lecture can be used in the game and can help them understand why is their profit not good enough? because they hadn't made the link. So we say that every time. And then also as the weeks pass by, we add more, more explanations. We say, okay, and have you thought of this now? So every week there is a new, a new experience. 
Absolutely, yeah. So it's it's really sort of providing those linkages between between the theory, as, uh, but not only between the theory and the practice, but it's providing the link with linkages between those different uh, yeah areas as well, isn't it? The the, the area, areas of theory which otherwise might be a bit more sort of isolated. Um, I was going to ask because I know that we've talked previously around your. So before you started to use the simulation, uh, well, certainly Vincent, I know. Yeah, some years ago when you started to use the simulation, I think before that you had also used a different approach, which was sort of moving towards this way, but it was more scenario based. Do you want to just talk us through a little bit about that? Yeah, it didn't work. Okay, <laughs> that's the end of that. <laughs> no, no, on. no, no <laughs> I'll explain. I mean, um, it was it was a scenario that I would have created myself basically, which was, you know, you think about a hypothetical company and you have to create enough background for that company and enough complexity for it to work and uh, to run through the whole thing. But it's, it was a lot of work and it, it um, I'm not sure if it really captured the uh, complexity of the real world that well. Um, and it was a lot of work to, you know, to keep it going and changing it. And I think, I mean, I did mention, I think uh, when I was talking about the nature of a simulation, is that it is dynamic and it mm. is not it's not a zero-sum game you know in a way because all of them i mean it is in to some extent because they compete but actually when we've looked at the different because we run this in workshops okay they do a lot on their own basically but we run the workshops and if you look at different city markets the markets they work in different markets can do better than the others you know in, in, in terms of their total achievement so it's not a zero sum game, um, but it is a dynamic thing where interaction mirrors the real world. And I think, and, and also it, in terms of the input of the tutor, it's a lot easier because we've, and you, you want me to say this, I'm sure Leon, we get great support from Edamundo uh, and any issues that we raise, actually they you know, are dealt with in terms of, you know, expl explanation or tweaking what goes on. Um, we also have the power to put in different news items so we can change the, the nature of, of the game as well as tutors. So I mean, this for me, this is a really, really, really positive uh, way of approaching it. And, and so the, dyna the dyna dynamism of this, uh, of the simulation is, has added another dimension to the way we, we can deliver and the way students learn. Sure, sure, no, absolutely. And I, I suppose, yeah, talking about in more detail about what you were saying about it's not a zero sum game and the fact that it is truly dynamic. Some of, some of the other ways we, we, we explain that as well is by saying that because students can, of course, all, all teams are meshed a little bit on profit and turnover, but beyond that, each team gets to define what success looks like yes. for them. So yes. maybe one team might decide that they want to be a, a market leader in a certain segment, for example, and then if they achieve that, they'll get awarded more points. And mm. I think that's a really nice part of it because that means then that uh, yeah, there, it, it is like every every team, like what how how what how well one team does might be measured kind of differently from another team. Um, but it also means, in terms of this dy dynamic nature, that for the next year's cohort coming through, they're not able to uh, have been shared the, the, the results, you know, from or you know the, the previous cohort aren't able to say this yeah. is how you do well in the game. Here's what you have to to here are the decisions you have to take because it just doesn't work in that way. Um, so we don't know what the outcome will be because every time it runs is is truly different. Yeah. Well, having said that, just one more thing. I mean, I think there is so much in the game. You know, there is so much, and it it does take a lot of work. It takes research. It takes a lot of application and knowing where to look for the information. You know, some students do that better than others. Yeah. Sure. No, absolutely. And I think that's also one of the uh, things on this this ten point checklist, Lombardi's ten point checklist, as well is uh, talking about sustained investigation. So I'm just looking at my notes here. Yep, um, right. Problems cannot be solved in a matter of minutes or even hours. So it should be uh, things which are happening over time and require significant investment from, mm. from the, the students as well. Um, I'm just gonna ask uh, my colleague Chaz actually, if it's a good, good chance now maybe to uh, deliver another one of the poll questions we have. So simple question, is your course authentic? Uh, would you say your course module is authentic? Single choice, very easy, yes, sort of, or no. And then after this, we'll uh, maybe talk a little bit more about assessment, I think. Uh, that might be quite nice. And then maybe a, a little bit about blended learning as well. So we've had around 
uh, 18 people have, have responded already, 19. Okay, so, well, yeah, good, a good mixture, actually. So I think uh, most people would say yes. Uh, some people sort of, only a few would say no. So that, that's, that's fair. And it's great to see, of course, that you're already embedding authenticity into, your, uh, into the curriculum of your modules as well. Um, perhaps we'll leave it there and end the poll there and we'll move on. Okay, well, Katarina, I know you've already talked a little bit about the, uh, the assessment, which is great, mm -hmm. but I just wondered perhaps we could, well, you tell me, would it, would, do you think it would be useful for the attendees to know a bit more detail around some of that assessment? Like, like how do you actually assess them? And what, what do you think? Is that, is that appropriate? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that that's fine. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I think I I said so. How, what are the two ways of um, of assessing? Um, I think I'm trying to think what uh, what uh, what the kind of detail would be interesting. Maybe so the fact that yeah, it, it, it's seventy five percent report right and twenty five percent group presentation, isn't it? Is that uh, it's not the group presentation. It's an individual presentation. Okay. So it's an in, yeah. So I can give some more detail okay. and of that in the game. So the individual presentation. So the two uh, the two pieces of coursework are linked, which means that the feedback they get on the presentation is very useful for them to then do the report because we basically give them feedback on how have they applied the techniques to a specific situation, and um, and that is exactly what they they need to do for most of the second assessment. So they are very well linked. So it's not that we just explain them how did you get this mark. We actually give them something which is useful and not just useful for the future, but useful for something very specific. Uh, and so the first uh, is, a, is a, a, a presentation. They need to record a presentation. It's individual presentations. And they often actually, it's quite interesting because they say that since they are all, for example, everybody in the same team, will they then all make the same presentation? Since the presentation is based on questions about the, 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 the firm, the company. And I say, no, you can all have the same company. The, the basic information will be the same, but you will have a different opinion. You will have a different opinion, for example, about the strategy you've chosen. You may actually not agree with the strategy. You may agree with it, but for different reasons, you may explain it in a different way. Then they are also asked to apply some very simple CBP kind of concepts. And again, they can apply different concepts, they can explain it differently, they can suggest different solutions for whatever problems they find. And that was a common question. How can we, having the same information, provide coursework, which is totally different? But yeah. yes, it is. Uh, it was the coursework was very different, actually. And I guess, like and Vincent now, was saying, if they're taking different roles, like CEO or, or CFO, then of course they can do the presentation from the perspective of the role that they took, right? Yes, that's something that they do, but also it's because they actually, they, they've understood something and their assessment of situations is different. They are different people, they have different knowledge and they look at the same question in a, in a very different way. And what we assess is how they, whether they demonstrate the knowledge, whether they apply it in a logical way. But as we know, for most questions, there is not just one answer. And now with the second coursework is the same. Uh, they have questions which are uh, very much, uh, they all can be different because it's coursework, which means that they could easily copy from each other, but it's a numerical, uh, it's, very, it's a quantitative module. So they do need to get the numbers right, but the marks are mostly about the interpretation of those marks and why did they choose one thing and not another, about their choices and explaining those choices. Um, so it is quite tricky. We got the first, uh, we asked them to submit a draft so that we could assess and give them some formative feedback. And it's quite interesting. Some students did really well, and others, they really struggled because they knew the techniques, but they were not quite sure how would they apply them. While others knew exactly how to do it, so it's um, it's very interesting. So you, yeah, so you get a, a good mix. Well, a, quite a wide uh, variety then of, I suppose, viewpoints in terms of their willingness to embrace that. Would you say, or do you mean more? what they're starting they're point. just willing to embrace because so formative fo uh, coursework is not compulsory which means that usually it's only the, the students who are keener and who are hard working would do it um so it usually demonstrate the students who are willing to embrace and who are interested but i think that at least at westminster it is the first time that we are doing this asking these kind of questions so they are not used to it and it's not that they can actually see what, so for example, next term, we would have some examples to show them of how 
to apply their knowledge, so at least they know what we are talking about. But this time, the idea that being assessed on uh, something they apply the knowledge, it's a very different concept. Although we've practiced on most weeks on the seminars, they still expect the kind of answer and question you get in an exam. So I think it's more about a new concept rather than, it's about understanding a new concept um, rather than about wanting to understand it or wanting to embrace it. Yeah, yeah. It's new. Yeah. I think that makes perfect sense. And well, it's this classic thing I always have heard for years. It's nothing new, but you know, that some, some students maybe will be more uh, willing to embrace things that are going to count towards their overall credit uh, and marks. Whereas if, if they know something isn't, then perhaps there's less willing to put, willingness to put the effort yeah. in. Uh, and maybe it's sort of a little bit speaks to, to, to that sort of thing. But I suppose, just you mentioned the exam there at the end of, of what you were saying and I know before you I think you did have an exam right before oh, yes you, we you had adjusted. yes it is the first, so until last year we had an exam which basically and the exam asked questions which were very similar to the kind of questions we would have during the seminars and so it was uh, uh, the students who were more quantitative could actually do it quite well uh, while now uh, you need to have more skills you need to be able you still need the quantitative skills but you also need to be able to write and to interpret things and to give your opinion. And you need to, uh, and, and it's interesting because in some questions I realized today, looking at one of the, of their draft work, it was that they would actually know the technique, but for example, this particular student knew the technique, but actually didn't know what it meant. And that's something that we would not have been able to assess in the exam, uh, or only at the very top level when they had to answer a text question, well, here you could not, just knowing the technique wouldn't give you any marks. You really had to know what you were doing first. No, and so it, it, it's very useful. And, and I think these students, if he, it, they just didn't, they don't know about this. They, they I think it's, um, it's, it's, a learn, it's a learning curve. Yeah, yeah. And it's absolutely. going to be very useful. I think it, because once they go out there, they probably would have forgotten everything they learn. While like this, I don't think they'll forget so easily. Yeah. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, and, and, in, and in simplistic terms, you know, just simply moving away from the exam based approach. So thinking about authenticity in the curriculum, you know, that that is very much, yeah, moving away from a traditional, more traditional uh, assessment approach to a much more authentic approach. Right. Because, well, again, linking it back to the whole skills, uh, graduate attributes, skills development, then, you know, it, exams typically aren't things that uh, we'll see in the workplace that we'll have to do as part of our day-to-day -day job roles, right? So we don't have to do exams in our in our day-to-day -day work for our employers, whereas actually reports or presentations, perhaps that is something that's much more akin to our day-to-day -day work. So it is truly authentic, isn't it, by, by, by moving away from that exam-based yeah. approach? I, um, so it's so I think there is a uh, there is a place for exams because if the and in a way this new assessment makes it harder for them because they need to grasp they need to have all the necessary skills to do the exam so they don't have the time constraint of an exam that they need to do something within a specific period they don't have the time constraint but they do need to have the same level of knowledge and it is harder because it's the same level of knowledge and one step more, more which is uh, being able to apply the knowledge and as we all know to actually be able to apply the knowledge is harder because we need, first of all, to decide which of the different things we've learned is useful for that particular situation and maybe a combination of them. So it is, um, uh, it, it is I think, it, so I, at, at first, I just thought, how can we assess them? And, uh, and it is, I think it is possible to assess them. And it's very interesting assessment. It really makes them think. And uh, I, that's the value of it. It's not just about testing their knowledge, but their ability to think, which is what we want from university education. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, we're, well, blimey, we're nearly at the top of the hour. So it's seven minutes to uh, the top of the hour already, but this is, uh, it's been really great so far hearing from you. I'm just wondering if perhaps before we break into um, showing the simulation a little bit and then moving on to the, mm, to, towards the questions uh, from the participants, is there anything you wanted to say about blended learning i know when we were we were talking previously oh, yeah you wanted to say about some some of the maybe the the challenges especially in the recent times of how things have transitioned yeah. into online and things do you want to talk a little yeah. bit about that yeah no i i can so um 
at the moment exactly is the ideal world because the students are they the simulation is of course is online so they do the stuff online and that's something they like uh, they like doing things in tablets computers and and they just enjoy that sort of environment but they also don't like uh, i think they prefer to talk with their colleagues live rather than talking online and that was a real challenge uh, last year when every, they had to on, they could only communicate via whatsapp or platforms such as Zoom, it, they just didn't enjoy it. Um, so this year is ideal because they can be in the cafe downstairs, in the cafeteria, discussing the game. Uh, and on, but at the same time, they are doing an online activity. So it's, it's, it's very good in, the, uh, in that respect. Uh, and also for us, for the teachers, it's quite good because we can actually uh, demonstrate loads of things in a, uh, in a way which is much easier than just having examples. If you just have examples from a book, yeah, you read the example and that's it in a way. While these we can demonstrate by just showing them a combination of images and words uh, by basically them clicking and identifying different options. We can choose whether to show them something more difficult or something easier. So it is, it's more fun. I think it's more fun, yes. And it can be, and the fact that it can be done both in class uh, by sharing a screen, by getting them to work together on a specific problem and then providing the solution online. And it, I think that really, that really helps. It makes it, um, it makes it more engaging. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, well, again, coming back to those, this 10 point checklist of authentic learning, there's something in there as well about this sort of giving students the freedom as well to find their own solutions to things, you know, to, to, yeah. to come up with their own ways of doing it. So it's not, it's not too, uh, yeah, we're not sort of dictating too much exactly how things should be done, but they can find out for themselves if they want to use a WhatsApp group or if they want to do a, a, a group Zoom call or, well, of course, each university has their own systems, I realise, but it's a little bit of, you know, finding out for themselves how they want to do things. Do they want to create their own shared Google spreadsheet to map out all of the responsibilities mm -hmm. and sort of project manage it a little bit? So it's providing that space. But certainly, you know, from experience, I think whilst it is nice to have all the students in the same room physically around a table discussing these things, from an employability skills development perspective as well, working in these remote teams online is, of course, more and more what we're expected to do uh, in our day to day work, I think, especially when working for a big corporate, for example. So, yeah, I think there's always positives where we have those challenges. Sometimes there's always positives as well for the students in terms of developing those skills. Okay. Yeah, indeed. I mean, yeah. one thing, one thing, sorry, I don't know if we've got one minute or so. Yeah, no, go for it. Go for it. Yeah, um, I mean, one thing we have retained is is the online lecture. These these tend to be large scale events. When they when they used to be on site, they used to be massive events where we had banks of students in, in these big lecture halls. But we 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 have retained the online lecture because we found that actually that works pretty well. And it works pretty well partly logistically, but also because um there is a degree of interaction by students that would not normally take place and participation that would not normally take place in a large lecture because they can actually uh, utilize the the chat uh, to interact during the course of the lecture and ask questions and there can be things going on so i think that that's been useful uh, one thing i wanted to say there was about the group work i mean what's interesting is we've got individual assessment here although clearly groups are important and they, they play the game in groups. But the point is, there's a difference here between group working and group assessment. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we've had problems with in the past is the group assessment angle and the university has sort of stepped back from that. Final thing I would say, and we I, well, I haven't mentioned it before, is um, I know there's a debate sometimes about whether you could use the game and use the performance in the game as a way of assessing. But I think that's a dangerous route to follow i.e. the most successful team gets the best points because it is contingent upon chance events, uncontrollable yeah. events. Mm -hmm. So we have a very small part of the assessment mark, which comes from their performance in the game, just to keep that competitive edge. Yeah. And so I think that replicates, yeah, it replicates real life in a way because you've got your performance related bonus related to the performance of the company and so forth. But it's you on your own who's determining yeah. uh, performance otherwise. Yeah. But if I, I may add that that small part, because uh, we have thought a couple of times whether we need to have it there, because yes, at the end of the day, it doesn't just reflect their own work, 
but it is essential. It's, it's a very small part. It really mm. doesn't change their mark that dramatically. No. But for the students, it really matters. Yeah. And they actually, and that is what makes them play because otherwise is what you, Leon, were saying before is that if something is not compulsory, they are busy uh, or they want to do other things. And if it's not compulsory, they won't be so keen. But if they know they're going to get 10 points or five points from playing the game, that gives them that incentive to actually go and play, even if at times it's hard. So, um, so yes, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crucial part, the points for mm. the game. These are all really strong points because, you know, I know from experience that we, we do have a number of uh, academics who use our simulations that do choose to assign perhaps a small portion of the overall credit to uh, fr from the ranking list of the simulation, mm -hmm. uh, the stock exchange, if you like, or, or whatever. We, we, we call it differently in some simulations. But I think from my perspective, whilst, of course, I understand the rationale for doing so, yeah, of course, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that you can you can often learn the most from from being the, the, the very worst team. You know, you know, the, the, we, we learn a lot from failure in, mm. in, in life and in in our studies. And I think, you know, that, that should really come across in the simulation that it's whilst every team hopefully wants to win and that competition, that competitiveness really comes out through the spirit of the, the simulation. It should also there should also be a strong recognition that, well, if you've if you've come last, you haven't necessarily it hasn't necessarily been a waste of time. It's been it's been a useful uh, way for you to learn. So yeah, but really good, uh, re really good points. It's been so good having this conversation. I'm going to ask my colleague Heis now to, to just deliver this last poll question, and then I'm going to show a little bit uh, the, an example of what the simulation looks like. So the one that you've been using at Westminster. Um, the question is: Have you used a management simulation in your teaching? Uh, so we'll see what the results. Uh, yes, currently. Yes, previously. So I, you have uh, perhaps at a previous institution or on a previous module or, well, lastly, no, you haven't ever. So currently it looks like uh, the people currently using a simulation are in the minority uh, in terms of our attendees. So we've had 17 answer so far. Uh, well, I think mostly people who are participating today, so I, our attendees have not used a simulation or we have a mixture of course as well. Um, perhaps actually there's slightly more who have either previously or currently. Okay, well, I'll stop that now. So I will share the results and perhaps it's a good time now for me to just share my screen and show a little bit about what this simulation looks like. So again, this will just be an example. This is the one that's being used at Westminster uh, in the uh, decision-making module. I'll just make it full screen. You can see it's actually on my browser. Uh, so yeah, we'll just show this as an example because perhaps for a lot of people who, who haven't used a simulation, it's good to just get a, a brief overview. I do realize we've already gone over time. Uh, apologies about that, but hopefully you'll stay on and we can get a good look at this simulation in, in, in a not too much detail, so maybe five minutes or so, and then we'll still have some time for questions afterwards. So please feel free to stay on. It'd be great to, to hear your questions uh, after I've just shown this in a little bit of detail. So the first thing to say is while well, the students are managing a footwear company, so a trainers or sneakers uh, company, and this home screen provides a little snapshot of different pieces of information which are accessible elsewhere in the simulation. So for example, a little snapshot of the top teams in the ranking list. Uh, what we first ask students to do is to add their board members. And we mentioned earlier that each team member, so each student member can take a different role in the, uh, in the simulation. So perhaps one can be the CEO or one can be the CFO, one the marketing manager, one the HR director. That's up to each team to decide. Or if you like, you can ask them all to uh, keep that empty and they all take an equal role in the decision making. They, ask, they, they put their first and last names in. Uh, but the company branding section is also quite nice for the teams to feel like they have a sense of ownership of the company that they're taking over. Uh, this team has gone for the name of Shooby Doo. Uh, well, they can name it whatever they like, and that should strongly link a little bit to their uh, chosen strategy, of course, as well as their slogan and adding their logo as well, which is kind of a nice way for the student teams to start off a fun activity for them to do together to come up with a logo that really summarizes what their team is all about what their business is all about. They, each team will have to do a lot of internal and external analysis. So in terms of the externals, well, they have to analyze these news items each round and they'll get different news items appearing in each round. And it's important that the teams are taking 
good note of those news items because often those news items will link to certain market events which will happen in certain rounds. So, for example, perhaps a, a global dip in demand for a certain uh, product or uh, yeah, a certain, a certain uh, product area. Uh, but it could be a number of things. So they have to do that. And then, uh, well, they have to undertake their internal analysis as well. So they have to look at their financials. And it doesn't matter whether it's a marketing or a strategy uh, module or a decision-making module, leadership module. It's important to give students those exposure, as we've discussed earlier, to the different functional areas. And that includes the financial elements as well. So exposure to the different financial documents, the income statement, the cash flow statement. Well, the teams have to do a bit of analysis by the different product groups. So in this simulation, uh, each team is operating across three product groups, men's trainers, women's trainers, and kids trainers. And they can view how, what the demand is for each of the product groups, what the sales have been like, what they've purchased in previous rounds, and how many trainers they have in stock in their warehouse. They can also look at the, the staff of their their business as well so how many externally hired staff for example they've got how many staff have left so that's good to keep an eye on of course as they link the the workload uh you know and the demand and they sort of link the two up so they can be workload staff motiv get, uh, motivation and education levels here too the next thing after they've done a lot of the analysis to, is to come to the business plan while well, here there there's a lot of discussion between the different teammates they're obviously deciding on what sort of strategic approach they want to take as a business so what generic strategy perhaps they want to be a cost leader or a product leader uh, and they elaborate a little bit on their decision here and save their results and they do that for a lot of the things so for example they'll choose uh, which markets they want to enter perhaps they just want to go for a few markets or maybe they want to go for all of the markets which might be quite hard to focus in any of the areas but it's their company, it's up to them, of course, to do uh, what they want. Uh, they do a SWOT analysis and they have to actually define their targets within this simulation. So as I said earlier, all the teams will be measured on the financials in terms of profit and turnover. But beyond that, they also get to define uh, other KPIs, uh, other targets, which they really want to focus on. So for example, let's say this team wants to be the overall market leader. Well, they can then choose to set that as a KPI and they can change this slider to really indicate their level of ambition. And they save their results once they've chosen five targets. Uh, well, there's a, a few other things, but once they've done all of this, they'll then come to the decision section. And everything up until this point has been more around setting the scene, doing the analysis, choosing the direction, but they haven't actually taken any decisions yet. And that's where this part comes in. So it starts off with this interactive map of a uh, fictitious sort of virtual uh, headquarters, office headquarters, and you can see they've got the warehouse and the boardroom and so forth. They can click in that way or they can click into the side here. So they can uh, hire and fire different managers and choose the focus of their management team. They can make purchasing decisions, increasing their warehouse size. And we have various videos uh, dotted around. They can choose their suppliers and uh, consider the carbon footprint of different manufacturers as well. Uh, they have to think a lot about their marketing decisions, of course. So there's things like what the agreements with the manufacturer and the cost for the items will be, investing in research and development. They'll have to set a cost price, uh, sorry, a selling price for each of their products too. And think about how they distribute their products. There's some quite detail on marketing. So online marketing, for example, thinking about the SEO, uh, the price per clip where they're bidding directly against the other student teams and investing in social networks and LinkedIn networks and that sort of thing. Uh, they can watch more videos here around the HR type activities where they can think about their recruitment, their onboarding, uh, how they're rewarding their staff and educating their staff and these sorts of things. So there's some financial things, auctions as well, where they're bidding against other student teams for the rights to use a uh, famous celebrity to endorse their products, an influencer. Uh, and then once they've done all of this, at the end of the round, once they've made all of their decisions, and it's the same calculation point for all of the teams, by the way. They'll then come to the ranking list. And here in the ranking list, they'll get to see how they've, they've performed in the last year of operations or round and whether they've gone up or down the ranking list. And hopefully, of course, they'll be top of the list and they'll see how they've changed and what their score is. Well, that's a very, very high level, quick overview of the simulation. Of course, the reality is that going through all of that will take a huge amount of time for each uh, team. So each team will discuss and negotiate with each other. Um, I'm going to stop talking now and just 
well, I'll literally throw it over to all the, uh, the participants, the attendees, and see if anyone would like to ask any questions. Um, if, if so, feel free to unmute yourself. I believe that's possible. If not, we can, uh, if you perhaps put your hand up, we can unmute you. So, you support simulations on accounting? Yes, we have a question already from Dr. Safar. So, do you support simulations on accounting, especially auditing? Well, we do have accounting simulations. So, for example, some which uh, focus on strategic management accounting. Uh, we have a lot of third year, so level six modules in, in the UK. Uh, who work with strategic management accounting. We don't have an auditing simulation per se, but it might be worth uh, exploring what we've got just to see whether we're able to align uh, with your modules. So for example, what we often do as a starting point of conversations is to ask to see your module specification, and then we can make recommendations about potential ways to align uh, our simulation and tweak it a little bit to focus. Uh, yeah. Um, Angela, I can see you have to go. Thank you for attending. Uh, Dr. Renu Sharma, uh, how long? Uh, Excuse me, Gray, I think. So, okay, so, so, so uh, I think that question is around the time expectation. So how long students should spend within the game? Okay, well, that's very flexible, actually. And what we usually say is that students a little bit sort of take the, they, they get a sense of how long they've got allotted to them. So for example, um, if they have a two hour seminar session or workshop session, then they can use those two hours uh, to, they know they'll have to make all of their decisions within those two hours. It's very, it's very flexible and each simulation we have, we can make it less or more complex depending on how much time you have available for the students. But Vincent and Katerina, perhaps maybe in, in thinking about your module, uh, how, what do you say to the students in terms of a time expectation? And do you have a specific slot of time that you, you allocate for them to, to compete? Oh, you're on uh, mute, Katerina. Yeah. Go for it. So uh, we do have, so we have a one, uh, one workshop weekly, uh, which some students use to uh, discuss uh, issues, but we also tend to use it to f sort of as a, uh, sort of to review how they are doing in the game and to also uh, give them an idea of things that they can actually use to work better. So we have like a theme every week. Uh, in the past, we've used the workshop more for them to play, but then one hour is relatively short. And also then it's not compulsory anymore because they can always think, oh, I can go at another time. Um, so yeah, so that's it in terms of allocated time. Uh, and then we tend to tell them, uh, I don't know, Vincent, I don't think I said anything this year, but normally it would be between about, like I tell them, at least three hours uh, and those students who do better tend to take, put perhaps six hours on it. Is that basically your assessment as well? Well, it's, it's interesting you say that because I've actually never, I've never checked on how long they spend. I, I, I suspect the, some students spend very little time and they don't do very well. And those students yeah. who, there's an optimum time in the middle, but uh, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The experience is that most of it takes place outside of the classroom and through sort of networks they have. They have they all have WhatsApp groups or whatever and they communicate, they meet, coalesce at suitable times to discuss things. So I don't know. I think the time is probably flexible. Yeah. I the thing so we asked them about uh, to set uh, to basically to on the first um, on the first workshop we asked the students to actually uh, say how exactly they were going to do the yeah. things. So to decide on all the practicalities. And so, the, and this, we started doing these actually during uh, the lockdown. So to see if we could get them talking because that was one of the problems. They were all, if they knew each other already fine, but if they didn't, it was a problem to get them talking. So we thought the easiest way is actually to give them something practical to sort out. And, uh, and so they had to say which platform they would be using, whether it would be Zoom or Teams or WhatsApp or uh, FaceTime or whatever. And then they also had to say how often they would meet. Mm. And that's when the question of the time came. So. There is a time, so some of the, some groups actually were meeting once a week, while other groups were meeting basically once a week for one hour, some once a week for three hours, and others they would meet twice, once for a very long meeting and then for a short meeting. So that would make basically the three hours. And then you have on top of that, any work they do individually, which I think some of them do individual work and others, not much. Okay, so it sounds well. It sounds like then, yeah, a, a wide range potentially of, of anywhere between 
say yeah three to six hours per week on each well on each round um so yeah quite quite uh, potentially more in some in some cases but i think it's also nice isn't it the students have that option so it's open to interpretation a little bit and that comes again back to what we were talking about yeah within this so it's their choice learning. yeah 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 and it's not it's, it's not dictated too much you know this is no. exactly how much you should spend it's, it's open to interpretation they have to figure that out for themselves exactly which is quite nice. But of course, you know, there are other examples, perhaps maybe maybe more so at first years, where maybe it is more appropriate to, to tell students, well, you, did have, you have a more definite uh, allocated time, you have your two hour yes. slot or one and a half hour slot. And well, of course, still, if students want to go off in their own time afterwards uh, and carry on working, well, that's nice to see, isn't it? Because that shows how, it, how engaged they are. Yeah. No, I think I agree with you. I think in the first year, I would actually tell them, okay, this is the minimum that you need to spend on it because then it's just easier for them to assess how much they have to do. I think second years, they would be able to also assess, there'll be some subjects which they'll know about because they come from different uh, backgrounds. There are some subjects which they already know. And so they won't need to do a lot of preparation work. They can just go to their group meetings and make the decisions. There are other subjects in which actually they need to do preparatory work based on what we've done in the, in the other teaching sessions to apply to the game. And that would require more time. But it, I think it needs to be their choice, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, Shaima in the chat there, thank you uh, for your comments there. You're very welcome. And uh, Amrit as well, you just made a comment about group dynamics. So perhaps that's also a little bit uh, of an appropriate time to just mention things around the team dynamics as well and the importance of that, I suppose, because whilst I think you, 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 you've mentioned it already, I know a little bit, uh, Katharina, but you know, actually having students in their teams well, whilst it can pose some challenges, it's also got some, some benefits as well. Of course, it's up to the teams for themselves to work out how things will work and how they share those responsibilities, isn't it? Yeah. So I find the team part very important because once they go in the workplace, I think you can do all your up to A levels doing very little group work, even if at school sometimes they ask for it. At the end of the day, you can do very well without having done much teamwork. Once you go into the workplace, I mean, I, there are very few jobs in which that's not required in one form or, or the other. And, uh, and so I think that experience is really important. And uh, some students, basically, um, they are very social and, um, and they just see that as an opportunity to be with their colleagues and they know lots of people. Others really, really struggle. And from a, a, a teacher point of view, it is one of the difficult parts of the game. It's basically how to encourage students who do not like and you don't want to participate in the group activity, uh, how to do that. And I think every year we decided, we arrange a new solution to this, but at the end of the day, I suppose it's just difficult. So it's uh, nothing that uh, there's no perfect solution. The, uh, in previous years, we told them to form their own groups. Uh, so they would form their own groups and uh, there were some who were just not doing it because they were totally left out. Uh, this year, we've tried to actually, uh, we set the groups ourselves in a totally random way. And uh, so far, the, basically, because they, there was no room for interpretation, there was no decision making, actually, the students haven't commented on it. They seem much happier. Because, I mean, whether they're happy or not, but there is no doubt. It's very simple. They are in that group, and that's it. So they no, don't have this anxiety that I should have a group, but I don't. Other people have a group, but I don't. They are in a group, group, I'm in a bad group. It's totally random. So it has made it easier, I think, although they are still the ones who can't uh, quite manage. And, um, and, it, and that's how it's life again. You have to work with whoever you have to work. You're not going to be working with your best friend or... So it, it's, uh, it's very useful, the group dynamics, I think. It's very useful to have them work in a group. No, absolutely. And that, well, I, I think sometimes it can be maybe an unpopular decision to uh, to force uh, the students into into different groups that they haven't chosen themselves because they want to be with their teams. But actually, potentially, well, I, I would say that actually there's, there's a lot of benefit from doing so, yeah. forcing those students out of their comfort zone a little bit, forcing them to interact and and actually they then make wider connections and, and networks, isn't it, throughout their university experience yeah. and develop a wider sort of set of viewpoints as well, which will be really helpful for their overall performance in the simulation. Exactly. And that is, so there are two, so one is that, so we haven't had the feedback from the students yet. So maybe I'll get feedback saying what a terrible idea. <laughs> we'll find out that in a couple of months. But in terms of receiving emails with a group issues, 
I haven't received, I think I've received just one this term, while normally I get quite a few. So, so that's why I think it is going well, this sort of not having the choice. And the other thing is that uh, we actually talked, a talked about it in the first class and we did talk about group dynamics. We did talk about the problem of groupthink and why it was so important to have diversity. So if we are talking about diversity, which is something that they are all quite keen on, then we need to have groups like that. You won't have so much diversity if you only work with the people you are very good friends with. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, well, Amrit, you've just mentioned in the chat there as well that uh, one has to be a team player to stay in the job. So this, this strongly links yeah. to the real world of work, doesn't it? Absolutely exactly. right. And um, uh, by the way, uh, Phyllis, I've just noticed you've, you've, you've said thank you in the chat. Thank you for attending. And, and also Graham, you've, you've mentioned uh, that you've also, yeah, well, you've used simulations or, or, your, or your colleagues have, they've also chosen to allocate the groups. Uh, so that it encourage working with anyone. So, so again, oh, yeah. that sort of mm -hmm. supports what we've we've just said. Uh, Dimitri, uh, how did you move away from group assessment? If there is no group assessment, what makes the students be team players, play ball? That's a really good question. So that actually is a question that we had ourselves. How are we going to do this? So the group assessment seemed unfair um, because... Uh, at the end of the day, say, they are still not at work and they uh, they can't just move somewhere else. So they, they are more limited in a way. So um, and there was the thing that I mean, some uh, teams really did all the work, for example, and the others didn't do anything. So like some, in one in some teams, there was one or two individuals who did everything and three who didn't do it. And it, it was just very hard. And at the end of the day, in a work sphere, you couldn't quite get that to that extent. Um, so when we moved to the individual assessment, it was tricky, but it turned out exactly not a problem at all because they are being uh, they have to express their own opinions on on the on the, the teamwork. Uh, they are all in the same team, but they all have different experiences of how the teamwork went and what was their role there. So you would have uh, students who, for example, did well in the team because they felt that they were just being very cooperative and listening to any, everyone. Well, others said that they were did very good in the team because contrary to previous years, they were much more self-assertive. -assert so to the same team, the same, exper the same good experience, very different interpretation because it's individual. And in terms of the decisions about the firm, again, uh, they explain it in a different way with different reasons. They choose different examples. So, um, so we, we, were, we had some doubts when we, we did this individual assessment for something which is a group. Uh, but it turns out it, 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 it works very well. And it also, in terms of assessment, is good because you can actually see how they can respond differently, some of them better than others, having the same basic information. I mean, we do, as we mentioned, there is, there is still a competitive element where the team is, is scored by its position, its ranking. Yeah. And actually, that is that mode. I, mean, I think uh, Demetrius's point was, well, how do you get them to work as a group? Well, they work as a group because there is a, even though it's a very small part of it, that there is something that, that's an outcome from group effort and, and the group working well. The other thing I have to say is the university has, has a restriction on how much can be group assessed. And at, at final year level, there's nothing, we can't use group assessment. In the second year, we're in any module, any core module can only have a 25% at most group assessed work. So the university, I think, re recognizing that students find it unfair to get one mark for a group. And I think we're, we're also reflecting reality of what students prefer okay well yeah really great questions anyway coming in um, <clears throat> from from our participants so thank you so much for your participation everyone who's joined today uh, I guess maybe as we've gone nearly 25 minutes over time I should probably try and wrap things up I suppose uh, although of course it would be great to carry on uh, talking but um, I just wanted to say a couple of things so one is actually it takes a uh, quite a lot of us uh, at Edumundo here to run these these simulations. So thanks all. You know, there's a, there's a lot of people behind the scenes that you can't see who are who are really getting involved and sort of helping out doing various um, roles around this. So thanks to the whole team for uh, your support with these webinars and, and making them run. Uh, but also really great thanks to you both from from Westminster to Vincent and to Katharina. It's been great to have you involved. We really appreciate your your support with this and. I'm sure, well, I know for a fact it's, it's been really useful for all the participants to, to sort of hear your views and your take on, on, on things. Um, 
do you have any final words? <laughs> no, like, thank you very much for inviting us. I mean, it's a real pleasure to, to talk about the game and how we're using it. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. Thank, thank you for everyone who's come along to listen. Thank <laughs> you.